Matthew chapter 18. And my primary text tonight is actually just a very short portion of Matthew chapter 18. Beginning at verse 1 through verse 6. Just six little verses. And when you have found the text today, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word with me? Amen. And the word of our Lord reads in this fashion, and I'm reading from the New King James Version this evening. At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him down in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whosoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Wow, the Lord had some interesting words there, didn't he? Pertinent to children. Would you bow with me? Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for this opportunity once again to hear from your word. Lord, there's not a thing in the world that I can ever say at any time that could benefit your people, those that are in this building, those that might hear this message by faith, outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, this hour you've placed a, a message on my heart that I believe could be a great encouragement and a great help to many. But oh God, if I misspeak, then it will accomplish nothing. So, Lord, this hour I ask that your anointing would rest upon me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Set my soul on fire with this word that you've placed within me, that I might deliver it, God, with boldness and fervor, that the people of God might be blessed and encouraged and lightened and helped. For we ask it all in none other than the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the church said, Amen. You may be seated at this hour. You know, I want to tell you, it is no mistake today that the Lord employed the term born again when speaking of our conversion from darkness to light, from our turning from error to truth, from our passing from death to life, from our abandoning unbelief for the pleasures and joys of belief and faith. Amen. It is no mistake that God used the term born again in speaking uh, in chapter 3 of the gospel according to John. It is no mistake that Jesus Christ, in speaking to Nicodemus, answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's not a mistake that the Lord used this terminology on that early meeting with Nicodemus, because later we find in our primary text tonight, in Matthew chapter 18, we find that Jesus is telling his disciples that if you have any hope in the world of ever being successful as a child of God, if you have any hope in the world of ever making heaven your home, it's not about how long you wear your hair. It's not about how long your skirts are. It's not how long your, your sleeves are. It's not about all the outside accoutrements uh, that are pleasing to the eyes of men and cause us to feel confident in ourselves that we are somehow righteous and godly and closer to him, the Lord said, no, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, then you've got to learn to become like this little boy. I'm talking to you today on the topic of grow down. Grow down. You know, as we're growing up, our earthly parents have a bad habit. Whenever we do something that annoys them and aggravates them, you know, what's the first thing they tell you to do? Grow up. Grow up. 
Like that's going to solve all your problems if suddenly you shot up to 21 years of age and six feet of height. All of a sudden, you wouldn't do that anymore. And then we wonder why there are 40-year-old men running around that are still acting like 12-year-olds. Because even though you may get older, it doesn't mean you've matured any. There are 12-year-old boys out there who have more sense in their head than 40- and 50-year-old men I know. Amen. This is why Jesus said to his disciples, if you have any hope in the world of being successful in the kingdom of heaven, I've got news for you. You've got to convert and become like this little child. He didn't say that, you know, you've got to uh, kind of emulate some of his characteristics and ignore others. That's not what he said. He said you've got to literally become like this little child. You've got to become childlike. Well, of course you do. If you're born again, then obviously you're going back to the place of birth. You're going back to where you started. Too many people are born again, or at least they like to think so, and then in the next breath comes out of their mouth is telling God what to do and how to do it. Hello now. I don't know very many babies come out of their mother's womb. Now, I tried. <laughs> and tell their mother immediately upon exiting, now mother, here's how you drive home. Right? Most babies don't do that. Most babies can't do that. But isn't it interesting that we as believers who have been born again into the kingdom and family of God, somehow we think we know more than God does, and we can tell him what to do, how to do it, when to do it, where to do it. Uh oh. Woo. Lord help us. It ain't time to grow up. You know what it's time for the church to do? It's time for the church to grow down. It's time for the church to get back to basics. It's time for the church to get back to understanding that we are the sheep of his pasture, that we're the children of his household. We're not the father, he's the father. Amen. We're not the ones calling the shots. He's the one calling the shots. I love these preachers on television. And some people get mad at me and don't ever want to come back to church because I name names. Well, okay, fine. Then don't come back. Don't bother me. Because if you're foolish enough to follow after half of these coops, then you probably don't even need to be in this church anyhow. Kenneth Copeland. The last 25 years, the man's been telling people that God is a waiter with a towel over his arm just waiting for you to tell him what you want. That whole name and acclaim it in prosperity doctrine. People say, do you not believe in prosperity? Oh, I believe in prosperity. But I believe that your definition of prosperity is gluttonous. Hello now. My Bible tells me, Paul the Apostle wrote and said, I would that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. But your first priority is your soul. Amen. Not whether you've got a Cadillac, not whether or not you've got a Lincoln, not whether or not you've got a Mercedes. None of those things are important, honey. If you wind up in hell, you're in hell. What difference does it make? It don't matter what you drove down here if you wind up. And by the way, I'm going to clarify something right now and probably make some enemies and who knows, maybe make some new friends in the process. I told you, God called me to a prophetic ministry. There are times that the Lord speaks to me about things and He tells me, I want you to tell people. And I'm sitting there saying, oh God, no, because I just know I'm going to have hell to pay, as the old saying goes. Those people that tell you that hell is eternal separation from God, that is a lie. That is a lie. That's an absolute lie. Paul the Apostle said, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall this, shall that, shall this, shall that. If I go to hell, am I separated? If I go to heaven, am I to No. Wherever I go, the love of God is there. The Bible also teaches us that God's creation subsists and exists by Him. He holds it all together. If He wasn't there, it would cease to exist. Hello now. The only thing that separates hell and the unbeliever throughout eternity from God and the believer is the great schism that was seen by 
that little old Lazarus, if you recall, as he was in the bosom of Father Abraham, and they looked at the rich man in hell, and the rich man in hell said, look at all this distance between us, but can't you send some water? But that didn't mean that God wasn't bigger than the skin. Did you hear what I said? Amen. So this notion that hell is separation from God throughout eternity, that's garbage. Uh, you're not separated. You can't be separated from God. You're created in His image. You're a living soul. Throughout all eternity, you're going to be a dead living soul. You're going to be a zombie. That's what, that's what, the, that's what the unbeliever will be, in a sense. He'll be a soul that is alive, that has a consciousness, but has no life. Because the Spirit of God will not have been breathed into his nostrils, allowing him to become a living soul. Now he's a dead soul. He's conscious, but without life. You can feel pain. You can feel it. You can see it. You can experience it. But you know what? You can't die. Ooh, that's the beginning. And then I want to say one other thing on the subject of hell. I'm not saying this, Tommy, either for your benefit, believe me. This has nothing to do with you. This is just what the Lord's laid on my heart, seriously, and I'm making that point. <clears throat> but I'm going to tell you something else about hell. The Bible said Jesus Christ will reward every man according to his works. And for those who believe and those preachers who get up in the pulpit and have the audacity to preach people into a devil's hell burning with fire and brimstone and just preach them into a frenzy and a terror because of who they are as a gay, lesbian, transgender person or because of who they are because of what they do. I'm going to tell you something, preacher. You're going to answer to God for that false message. You're going to answer to God for that false message. I've got news for you. The unprofitable servant was not cast into fire. The unprofitable servant was cast into darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is what we call degrees of punishment. That means that God's not going to whip Adolf Hitler with the same whip that he's going to whip somebody who stole candy from the grocery store. But many preachers and many churches and many denominations over the centuries have loved to present the notion that, you know, all those who get into heaven are all going to be up there, glory, 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 and all those who go to hell are all going to have the same exact reward. Lie. They're not going to have the same exact reward. There are degrees. There's, there's a different punishment for a rapist than there is for someone who writes a bad check. But you know what? You still won't be in heaven. Amen. You still won't have life in you. You'll still be a living soul, a zombie, in a sense, spiritually, throughout eternity. And the things that you may bear witness of, the things that you may see throughout that time, would be enough to make sci-fi writers regurgitate in fear. You may not be the one in the fire, but you may have to watch them. Amen. I'm not trying to sound ugly, but I'm just telling you. You may not be the one who's experiencing the flame, but you may hear their cry. You understand what I'm saying? But you know what? I'm too busy tonight, like I tell people. I'm too, I'm too busy trying to help people make heaven to, to stand around trying to scare people out of hell. Amen. I'm just, you know what? Jesus, his whole ministry was trying to help people understand the kingdom of God. He didn't spend half his time preaching about hell. Amen. He didn't spend 20% of his time preaching about hell. He spent the majority of his time preaching the kingdom of heaven. But John the, the Baptist came along as the precursor to Jesus Christ. What did he preach? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's what we're supposed to do today. Preach the kingdom. Preach the kingdom of heaven. Is it here? It's accessible. It's as close as you can reach out and grab hold of it. That's how close it is right now. My friends, whether you're straight, gay, cross eyed, or blind, if you can reach out and touch the hem of his garment, that's how close Jesus Christ is to you right now. You can make it in. You can be part of the family. The only thing is you've got to learn to grow down a bit. Amen. You need to learn to 
Recognize when you're born again that you're starting all over. You're starting from scratch. You're starting out as an infant, a baby. When Jesus Christ, in other places in the Gospels, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, Suffer the little children, come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You look the word as we see in this text today that we used. In Matthew 18, you look the word children up or child up and you find that the Lord literally was saying you must revert back to an infant-like state. Amen. Not, not, not a grown child, not a five, eight-year-old child, an infant. You want to get into heaven, honey, you got to learn when you get born again, you better learn that you're starting all over again. You're starting from scratch again. In God's economy, things are so much different. The term children in the Greek literally refers to an infant or a baby. The Lord today desires that we grow down and learn once again what it's like to be an infant or a toddler who is entirely reliant upon their father. Hallelujah. You know what children do? Let me tell you what children do. Children love without condition. Amen. A child knows nothing of fear, prejudice, hatred, malice. A child will love everyone and everything with which it comes into contact without reservation. You put a dog up in front of a baby's face and chances are he's going <laughs> to that dog might want to eat him alive. But unless that child's had a bad experience with a dog before so that he's learned fear, he's going to love everything you put up near it. You give it a little plush toy, you know, and you, you, you start goofing with it. It could be the ugliest little thing. I can't even imagine being a little five-month-old baby and having this horrifying little monkey beast staring at me going, woo, 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 woo. and yet there's the baby. <laughs> and as adults, we pay nine bucks a head to go into a movie to have a big monster beast wiggle in front of us, and we go, ah! See, we've learned fear. But a child doesn't fear, a child loves. It's in their nature to love. Do you know when you're born again, God wants you to be like a little child. He wants you to be like an infant. He wants you to learn. I don't care if that's the ugliest transgender person ever walked into your side of you. You just love the fire out of them anyway. Amen. I don't care what background that person came from. I don't care what culture they came from. I don't care what the color of their skin. None of it matters to me. Why? Because I haven't learned prejudice. I haven't learned fear. I haven't learned homophobia. Because all of those things have to be learned. But the Lord said, no. I want you to be like that baby before they learned all that crap. Oh, am I telling the truth today? Amen. A child will love unconditionally. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. The Lord said, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. You ever notice how generous kids can be? You ever notice how generous a little baby can be? They just give it all away, don't care. They ain't got nothing left, it's all right. Just give it all away. They don't care, it doesn't matter, you see? We, we often read this verse and it says, pray for your enemies and love them that despitefully use you. And we think, God, you're asking us to do the impossible. He says, no, I'm not. I'm asking you to grow down. I'm asking you to act and think and believe like a child. Amen. You know how easy it is to love your enemies? It's easy when you're a baby because you don't even have any cognizance of the fact that you have an enemy. Amen. 
get along with somebody. But let me give you an example. The old story of of uh, Romeo and Juliet by by Shakespeare. There's a feud going between the families. The father hates the daughter, and the other father hates the son of the other father. Why? Because they're related. Because they're blood. That's all. That's the only reason. Juliet's father doesn't like Romeo's father, and Romeo's father doesn't like Juliet's father, and for that reason, they don't want their children to marry either. He's my enemy every bit as much as his father is, just because he's the son. But you know what? When that baby was born, he had no idea that Juliet's father had some kind of a problem with his dad. You understand what I'm saying? Didn't even know he had any enemies before... Before he even had a chance to go out and do anything, he already had enemies, he already had people who didn't like him. Why? Because he was related to his dad. I got news for you. You're born again. <laughs> Every devil in hell hates you because you're related to your father. Amen. But the problem with the church is we tend to adopt too many people as our enemies and they're not our enemies. Let me tell you something, Paul Well, Now, I may not agree with the queens running out and dancing in the streets and partying and carrying on at gay pride over there in Lynchburg, but they're not the enemy. Amen. They're not the enemy. i got news for you, dummy. They're not the enemy. And my Bible tells me, Mr. Paul Well, you need to grow down. You need to become a little more like a child, like an infant, like a toddler in your faith so that you can look at people and not look at them with judgment and criticism and condemnation, but you can look at them with love and acceptance and not even think a bad thought. Amen. I know I'm telling the truth tonight. A child loves unconditionally. Look what else the Word of the Lord says in 1 John chapter 4, 18 through 21. There is no fear in love. You know what homophobia means? Fear of homosexuals. Homophobia, when someone is said to be homophobic, that means that they are fearful. Well, honey, if you would just grow down, you'd be like a baby and you'd just let everything come your way. And guess what? There is no fear in love. Did you hear what I just said? There is no fear in love. All of a sudden, you'd be able to just love the fire out of everybody and wouldn't have any problem, wouldn't have to condemn or criticize or, or you know, preach somebody into hell. You wouldn't have to do it because there's no fear in love. A lot of these messages coming over the pulpit are not born of love. They're born of fear. Whew. Oh, Lord, we need some folks in the church today to grow down. There is no fear in love, but perfect love or complete love casteth out fear because fear has torment. If anything will put a problem in your craw, it's fear. Get afraid and see if all of a sudden you're not tormented by that fear. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he say, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him that we that uh, he who loveth God love his brother also. Mm. So see, you wouldn't have people running around doing report cards on other members of the church and reporting them for conduct and behavior that you didn't think was appropriate for a believer because, oh, I saw Brother Sozo going somewhere he shouldn't have been going and I'm going to go tell the pastor or in some organizations, I'm going to go report it to the elders. Hmm, that's love. That's love. My Bible tells me, honey, you know what? 
You're, I'm going to tell you right now, half the people who do that crap are doing it because they think they're going to get a pat on the back in the process. They think that they're going to get, that, that by turning you in for your little evil deed, hallelujah, that they're scoring points in heaven. So you know what their action is born out of? It's fear. Everything they do is born out of fear. Every little word comes out of their mouth is born. It's not born out of love. It's born out of fear. I got news for you, children. My Bible tells me you're not even in the family if you can't love. Amen. You're not even in the family. I just read it to you. You're not even there. You can call yourself a Christian until you throw up blood. That doesn't mean you are. Amen. God's church is a loving body. I thank God that I was born. I'm going to tell you, I thank God I was born within the ranks of the Pentecostal movement. I do. I thank God for it. Because we love people. I remember growing up, and our church loved people. We embraced people. We weren't constantly looking how we could kick somebody in the teeth and how we could... Uh, if somebody had a fault or a failing and how we could somehow make a big spectacle of it. No, 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 no. We knew that according to the scripture, if any man be overtaken in a fault, then they which are spiritual ought to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We knew how to deal with folks. And we knew that the best remedy and the best salve and the best cure for everything that ailed you was love. God's church couldn't afford to alienate you. We couldn't afford to say something or do something that was going to force you out of the walls of the church because then you wouldn't be where the help was. You want to chew tobacco, chew the kind of church. Come on now. You want to smoke cigarettes, smoke them, honey, but come to church. You want to get drunk on Friday, Saturday night? Go get drunk, but be at church on Sunday. Because you're never going to get helped out of that if we push you out of here. Now, Lord, have mercy. Why don't I preach against everything? That's the reason why. Because I want folks to be here so they can get the help they need in time of trouble. Amen? 1 John 3.18, my little children, listen to the phraseology, talking about growing down. Look at what John is saying, my little children. He's addressing the people of God like they're children. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. My Bible tells me love covers a multitude of sins. Do you know that it tells me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Apostle Paul wrote about love, and he said that love thinketh no evil. Amen? Am I right? He said, he said charity, love, said it doesn't think any evil. It doesn't believe anything evil. It won't even believe an evil report. Amen. That's why I know some of these outfits out there call themselves churches that claim they're representing God. I know they ain't. Because they ain't acting in love. Ain't nothing they're doing is acting in love. Everything they do is based in fear. And then on top of that, they're more than happy to think that their brother is doing something he shouldn't be doing. Oh, I know I just said it. They're just happy. Oh, they almost rejoice. The Bible says that love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So you know what? If they're doing something wrong, there ain't no cause for rejoicing. The only time I rejoice is when my brother doing something right. The only time I revel is when my brother doing something right. When somebody gets up in testimony, like I had one of my members in New York City get up during the testimony service one night and say, Brother Morrow, I've been coming to this church for several months now. He said, and when I first started coming here, I had a sexual addiction. And I didn't even realize I had a sexual addiction. He said, I, I, I honestly didn't realize. He said, but I 
My parents died when I was 18 years old and left me custody of my brothers and my sister. He said, I've been raising them since I was 18 years old. Their house was not paid off. I had to pick up the mortgage payment to keep us in a place to live. He said, I got to the point in my life where I hated being alone. I was tired of being alone. I just wanted somebody there with me. He said, I found myself going to the bars every night. Just trying to find somebody to fill my that void that I felt. He said, I didn't care about sex, but if that's what it took to get them to come home with me, then okay. He said, but you know what? I've been coming here for a few months, he said, and the other day I went home after work and I was just singing and happy. He said, and all of a sudden it just dawned on me. My God, it's been two months since I've even been in a bar. You see? Is that because Brother Mara preached against sexual addiction? Is that because Brother Mara preached against the bar room? No, no, no. It's because Brother Mara wanted to preach what this man needed to hear, which is the love and grace of God. And as he received from God what he needed, all of a sudden what he didn't need was all the stuff he'd been trying to get before. You see? Isn't that wonderful? But you know what? I knew he was going to the bars when he first came to my church. I knew he was leaving church to go to a bar. Did it make me happy? No. But I loved it. Amen. Did it make me thrilled to know he was going out after church? No, but I loved it. In the end, what happened? Love conquered all. Amen. You've heard the old saying, love conquers all. Love, the love of God, conquered. His craving for someone in his life, when he finally realized God loved him and God was there for him, you know what? He didn't need anybody else. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Children today, not only do they love, but they trust. If a father were to ask his child, and I've heard the story told of a child who was playing out in a sandbox, and a father come out on the porch and he picked up his rifle and he listened and he, and he said, Johnny, don't move. Don't move. Then he picks his rifle up and he's aiming it right in the same direction as Johnny. And Johnny's sitting there thinking, well, I don't know what Dad's doing, but it's my dad talking. So I'm going to trust him. And he froze in spot and all of a sudden the hammer on the gun pulled back and fell forward and it pushed that bullet out through the center of the barrel and right down into the head of a rattlesnake that was right behind that boy. The boy didn't see the snake, but the father did. And when the father said, son, don't move, it was a life or death command, and the boy trusted his father even though he stood there with a gun in his hand. My Lord, have mercy. Can we trust God like little children and know that whatever He is doing, it is for our ultimate good and benefit? Amen. Whatever He's doing, it is for our ultimate good and benefit. <laughs> children trust. Many parents in the human community are able to murder their own children today because their children sheepishly and trustingly follow uh, them right to their deaths. Look at the woman who drowned four of her own children. How do you do that? Because children trust. By nature, they trust. Mommy's not going to hurt me. I have nothing to fear. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We need to grow down this afternoon. We need to learn like an infant, a toddler, a child. We need to learn to love. We need to trust. Children believe a parent can tell a child anything, and that child will believe it. Why? Because the father said it. 
That's how things like prejudice and racism, homophobia and chauvinism are passed down from generation to generation. If you ever watch the old episodes of All in the Family, then you realize that many of Archie Bunker's belief systems he accredited to having received them at the knee of his father. Well, my father used to say, my father used to do this. And I got news for you, children. Children will believe anything you say. My brother, bless his heart, is given to some tall tales sometimes. And his kids just eat it up with wine and cigar. If daddy says he picked up a tow truck in one arm and a fire truck in the other arm and tossed them into the ocean, they're going, yay! Because children believe. Amen. Lord, help us to grow down so that when you speak a promise to us, we can believe it. Instead of arguing and fighting with God, we can just accept it and believe it. Mark 10, 13 through 16, And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child. If you can't believe it like a child, you can't receive it. He shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus Christ declared, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, Honey, I'm not a liar. If I'm telling you this, I'm telling you because it's so. Oh, we need to grow down a little bit and learn to take God at His word. Amen? Learn to believe Him when He says it. And that promise that says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Honey, there's not a one of us in this room that won't be clinging to that promise when we face our death. But God help me to have grown down enough so that I just believe it and sleep. Amen. Children love, they trust, they believe, and they learn. A child can be taught virtually anything. A child is said to be most teachable during his first five years of life. The vast majority of major skills that we will learn in life are learned between birth and five years of age, including speech, and the ability to learn. See, if you don't learn to learn, then guess what? There's no sense in even trying to learn because you don't know how to. Amen. You see what I'm saying? So, so as infants, as toddlers, as little ones, we first learn how to learn. That's why parents who encourage their children to read or set the example by reading with their children. They're helping their children to learn how to learn. That's how you learn, you know. Deuteronomy 31, 12 and 13. Gather the people together, men, women, and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law and that their children which have not known anything. You hear what God said? And that their children who which have not known anything. In other words, when they're so young that their mind has already been cluttered with a bunch of junk. Nothing worse than trying to teach somebody the truth who's had nothing but garbage and error and lies and false doctrine told them their entire life. Amen. From the time they're an infant. Because you know what? They may not even believe half of that garbage, but you know what? They can't get it out of their head. Ask Tommy if I'm telling the truth about that sometimes. 
Can't get it out of your head. Why? Because that's what you've learned. Doesn't even mean you necessarily believe it, but that's what you've learned. How many people today are part of the Roman Catholic Church, not because they're practicing Catholic, but because that's what they learned as a child and they can't get it out of their head? Because that's what children do. They learn. And I've got news for you. Most of the, our most important lessons in life are learned through the medium of example. Amen. Do you know why God Almighty, the Father of all glory, the Father of light, came down to planet Earth and revealed Himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know why He did that? To be an example. You know why they called him the Son of God and they didn't call him God the Father? So he could be an example. Amen. If he had come to be the Father, he wouldn't have been an example. He would have been the unattainable height that we'll never get to anyhow because he's something we're never meant to be. But by coming and revealing himself as a man, and separating himself in his humanity from the divinity that lies within, which is why we often hear that kind of second person language in the King James. Well, my father is such and so. When you pray, pray like this. Our father, which art in heaven. Now, why is he talking like this when the father is within him? Right, it's easy. He's being an example. By the sense that he could be our example. So that now, when we want to know how to serve God and live for the Lord and all that, all we have to do, he, 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 we, we read the Gospels and it's right there. It's all laid out. It's all exemplified. What would Jesus do exactly? Isn't that incredible? See, Mother, I told you to be a couple nuggets there, you like. <laughs> Children grow. I'm sorry, uh, children learn by example. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What was he saying? I'm your example. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Life is always so easy for the incense, isn't it? He hasn't got a care in the world. When you're born again, it's the same thing. When you learn to grow down, you haven't got a care in the world. All of a sudden you're going through life and the devil's tossing garbage at you, tooth and toenail, and you're like a baby going, the battle is not mine but the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't pay the rent, my daddy does. Come on now. I don't make out any checks to pay the mortgage, daddy does. I don't make car payments, daddy does. Hallelujah. Whatever I need, daddy brings it to me. Whatever I need, daddy buys it for me. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. Learn to grow down like a little baby. And guess what? You'll be just like a baby in this carriage. Hasn't got a care in the world. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting something out of this. Children grow. You cannot stop growth. It naturally occurs whenever the organism is healthy. First Peter 2, 1 through 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile. These are two attributes that children don't have. He said, and hypocrisies and envy. Guess what? Children haven't got that either. And all evil speaking. I've never heard a kid that, that was a year old or two years old have anything nasty to say about anybody. But then listen to his very next words. As newborn babies. Did you hear me? He's saying, grow down. Lay aside all these things and grow down. Get back to the place as a newborn baby and desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 
that you can put all this other garbage out and let the Word of God in, you'll grow up all right, but you'll grow into something completely different and something completely better. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Tonight children love, they trust, they learn, they believe, they grow, they rely. Children wait and rely upon their parents to provide for their needs. Amen? As children of God, we're so often running around like chicken with our head chopped off trying to make it happen for ourselves rather than relying upon God to do it for us. Matthew 7, 7-11 Ask and it shall be given you.